Support for Amanpour comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully, so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Amanpour. Tonight, as a growing chorus of religious leaders speaks out against separating children from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border, I asked the Reverend who blessed President Trump's inauguration about the administration invoking scripture to justify this policy. Plus, children gripped by a thoroughly modern curse, tech addiction. Children's rights campaigner Baroness Kidron says this should be a public health issue. And she joins me here in the studio. and welcome to the program. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. Immigration seems to be occupying the world stage. It is roiling Europe and heartbreaking images of traumatized children at the U.S.-Mexico border are being beamed across the globe. But now protests against this zero tolerance, which is the Trump administration policy of forcibly separating migrant children from their parents, are rolling in from an unexpected corner. Evangelicals, an essential building block of Trump's loyal base, they are weighing in. They're calling the policy disgraceful, immoral, and even devastating. Clergy from Jeff Sessions' own church, he's the attorney general, the United Methodists, are bringing church law charges against him, saying tearing children away from parents is unnecessarily cruel. And the Presbyterian Church, which is Donald Trump's denomination, calls out, in the name of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, stop. And even today, President Trump doubled down, saying the United States needs security, whether it's politically correct or not. The Reverend Samuel Rodriguez is also speaking out against this practice. He is president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. He's an ally and advisor to Donald Trump and one of the few clergy chosen to speak at the president's inauguration 18 months ago. Take a listen. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So, a little of the Beatitudes from Reverend Rodriguez, who joins me now from Sacramento, California. Reverend, welcome to the program. I wonder first, before we play you some of the really devastating audio that's come out from the border, what in general you make of, the, of what's happening there right now? This, po this policy, the separation of families, can best be described as morally reprehensible, anti-Christian, and anti-American. It is completely unnecessary, without a doubt. It is egregious, and we must find an expedited solution as expeditiously as possible. We're calling upon Congress to act this week. Ted Cruz, Diane Feinstein, John Corn, and others are offering solutions that will bring an end to this tragic, horrific policy. Uh, Reverend, uh, one of the other senior senators, Lindsey Graham, has said the president himself could end this with a phone call. It's not federal law. He could end it with a phone call. Have you advised him to do so? Have you been in contact with him at all? I haven't been in contact with him on this matter. Uh, in full disclosure, again, it's not a Trump bill that he signed. This is uh, the convergence of a 1997 Flores settlement with the Clinton administration. Subsequently, the convergence of George W. Bush's Wilberforce Act. We've had great intentions, by the way, against human trafficking. And then this, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeal in 2016 expanding the Flores settlement and the Wilberforce Act. So it's actually the Trump administration implementing policy already in place with zero sort of grace. Again, it's wrong. It's, it's morally reprehensible. It's anti-Christian. I'm calling upon Congress and the president to act as soon as possible. We can't separate 
families. There's nothing Christian about it. There's nothing redemptive about it. Listen, I agree with the president. We have to protect our border. I agree with the president. We have to stop illegal immigration for many purposes, even from a moral imperative to end sex trafficking and human slavery and the coyotes exploiting people on the border without a doubt. But this is not the best way to get the message across. In the matter of fact, I find it to be reprehensible to use children as tools of political expediency. So, Reverend, I want to play you this audio that has really been shocking people. It's come from ProPublica. It's a non-profit investigative journalist operation. And it's audio that was taped of these children at the border in severe stress and distress. Let's just listen. <laughs> Bueno, aquí tenemos una orquesta. Reverend, I saw you shaking your head It's, there. You know, you know what's ironic? I'm moved by this. Let me tell you why. For those that don't understand the Spanish vernacular in your audience, the border agent is actually saying, well, look what we have here. We have an orchestra playing. Uh, what we need is a conductor. My God, these are children crying out for help, crying out for dad, crying out for parents. This is so wrong. What we're hearing right now, by the way, what we're hearing right now is the crescendo of voices from a base that supports, by the way, strongly supports his president on religious liberty, on life issues, on so many issues that expand our ability to preach the gospel of love, grace, truth, and hope. So we support the president on this matter. But that same base, listen, we reached a tipping point when Franklin Graham, one of the most conservative mm -hmm. evangelical leaders, not in America, but on the planet, when Franklin Graham comes out and says, this is completely wrong. There's yeah. nothing right about this whatsoever. So we've reached that crescendo now where the evangelical supporting base is calling out for the president and Congress to act immediately on this matter. So, Reverend, I wonder then, talking about people who support the president is really important because they have the credibility with the base. So you're talking about the evangelicals, a very, very key plank of his base. But also we have the conservatives, some might call it right-wing media, for instance, in, on Fox News. So I wonder whether you think they also need to change their tone. This is what Ann Coulter, a very, very prominent supporter of the president on this harsh immigration policy, this is what she said on Fox News about this tape and about the, the, the heartbreak of the kids. Just listen. These child actors weeping and crying on all the other networks 24-7 right now. Um, do not fall for it, Mr. President. I mean, that's brutal. Ch ch child actors. Child actors. Child actors. Listen, I have, in full disclosure, I have friends on, on the Fox News Network, and I can, I can assure you that Anne does not speak on behalf of the Fox Network or on behalf of many of the correspondents or pundits whatsoever, uh, without a doubt. Child actors, that's just silly. Again, that's intellectually, na that's intellectually naive, emotionally brutal, and silly. Absolutely wrong. Hey, there are midterms coming up. There are midterms coming up. And that same 81% evangelical supportive base that does support the president and commends him and applauds him on so many issues, by the way, that same base may not turn out this November if this policy is in place, intact. I can assure you there is great angst and consternation on behalf of evangelicals around this issue of separating families. Again, there's nothing Christian about it. Mm. It's, it's actually anti-Christian. If there's anything Jesus advocated for was protecting children, let the children come unto me because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. So Christ is the quintessential child advocate in all of the universe. And this policy runs counter to the spirit and the ethos of Christ. You know, you said it doesn't represent Fox, uh, but actually Laura Ingraham, who's another 
very, very prominent Fox commentator and contributor, said that, you know, these cages that the kids are being put in, she called it summer camp, this, this sort of detention area yes. for the kids. Yeah, so yes. the thing is, it may not represent the whole of Fox, but it's a very, very loud voice for Trump supporters. And I just wanted to ask you, because the facts are here, CNN did a poll, and basically it shows that the overwhelming majority of Americans, 67%, disapprove of this zero tolerance policy, this separation sure. policy. But when it comes to Republicans, 58% approve. You know, they're getting, they're getting, I don't know where they're getting their info from and why they approve. What would you say to that? Well, I, was, I, I would say to all Republicans and all conservatives that advocate this idea and notion. That let's historically speaking, well, since 1980, the Republican Party has been the champion of what? The, the pro-life, pro-family platform, right? The pro-family platform. You can't be both pro-family and be in favor of separating families. There's a, there's a lack of a, a cognitive continuum there. And even a moral continuum. So if you are pro-family, you can't support separating families. Again, it's we, this dichotomy we create, I am in favor of border protection. I am in favor of stopping illegal immigration, but I am equally opposed to separating families. Why do we have to be either or? And that's the problem. Some, some suffer, both on the left on the, and, and on the right, they suffer from, from myopia. Mm. They have a tunnel vision, and, and they lack some sort of a, of a comprehensive meta-narrative. We need to stop this. And conservatives need to realize there are midterms coming up, and they need to mobilize the base. 80% of evangelicals supported Donald Trump. That's a strong base that turns out to vote midterm and every four years. This base right now is full of consternation, angst, and becoming very upset. There is righteous indignation, righteous indignation rising up right now in the evangelical community around the issue of immigration and the separation of families. By the way, I agree with President Trump when he stated the onus falls upon Congress. If they want to change the law, let Congress change it. I'm calling upon my friends in Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, Nancy Pelosi, and Paul Ryan, who I know personally, I'm calling upon them right now to act and Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer to act in the Senate in the next seven, eight days and find a solution to this immigration melee. I, I wonder what your own flock, your own churchgoers are telling you, because you have responded, you know, quite uh, categorically to the religious imperative here and the moral imperative. So I wonder whether I can just play for you. Uh, these uh, sound bites over the last week that we've heard from the Attorney General and indeed from the White House podium, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the spokeswoman, which specifically invoke the Bible and the scriptures to defend this policy. I just want you to listen. I know you're exercised about this. You can tell me about it on the other side. I would cite you to the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans uh, 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained, ordained the government for his purposes. Orderly and lawful processes are good in themselves. I can say that uh, it is very biblical to enforce the law. Uh, that is actually repeated a number of times throughout the Bible. Um, Reverend, you know, biblical scholars have pushed back very heavily, uh, and I can see you are too. In fact, they remember that way back when these very, very same scriptures were justified, used to justify slavery and all sorts of other, you know, horrors, but certainly slavery. So what do you make of today's politicians, leaders of the, of the country, making these invocations? Yeah, let me, let me just give a word of advice to all politicians. If you have if you have not graduated with a demon or a, a doctor in theology from a, a viable accredited seminary that preaches and advocates biblical orthodoxy or biblical truth, don't cite the Bible. Don't cite the Bible, especially don't cite the Bible to justify actions that are so controversial and run counter to the meta narrative of Scripture of truth, love, grace and hope. Do not. Dear Mr. Attorney General, with great due deference, please do not cite Romans 13 to justify a policy that runs counter to Genesis to Revelation. Do not use one scripture, one scripture to justify an action that runs against every other scripture in the Bible. Please stick to your attorney general mandate and assignment with great due deference and do not let the preachers preach. 
let the attorney general do his job. But it's again, it's 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 wrong. It's inappropriate. And we're not accepting it and we're not embracing it. We are what we tolerate and we won't be complacent. And as you can tell, I'm passionate about this. Silence is not an option and we won't be silent. And again, I agree with the president. I agree with my president. Congress needs to act now. By the way, I did hear the president this past Friday state explicitly that he is opposed to separating families, that it is wrong. And then I heard his wife, the first lady, say the same thing. So I agree with them. Now that it's wrong and we have former first ladies making a statement, uh, my friend Jeb Bush and others, let's come together. Let's get Congress to act immediately in the next week. Um, Reverend, I think, listen, you're absolutely right. Congress has punted this over and over again. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a real yes. shame, and it's now reaching its terrible human cost and crescendo on the border. But many are also saying the president is punting as well because he could stop this. It is not part of any mandated policy. It's his own administration's policy. But what I want to ask you this is I wonder whether you can look at this graph that we're putting up which basically shows that um, the whole premise is that America is being overrun with illegal immigrants. That's what President Trump said again. But in fact, arrests of migrants are down under President Trump, something like half from what we saw under President Obama. So it kind of undermines the premise that somehow there's a terrible danger afoot and a great threat to the republic. And we got to balance this out. Uh, listen, I, I'm in California. And I, I have seen the egregious impact of, of what, what, what I called the infiltration of nefarious activity via the conduit of certain sectors of the undocumented community, primarily the Metro Salvatrucha, uh, those that the president has highlighted. I have seen that impact in Los Angeles and throughout the state of California and New York and other regions of the country. So I do agree with the president. We have to stop illegal immigration. Indeed, there are people that want to do us harm. Uh, but... I'm, I'm still committed to believing 98.7% of the people that are here undocumented are, are amazing people. They really are created in the image of God and committed to doing good for themselves and for their families. Now, I want them to come here legally, but we need to find a way to integrate them. No, I don't think America is being, taking over, is being taken over by undocumented individuals. I do not. I do believe we have to stop illegal immigration. So we have to find a happy medium as expeditiously as possible. But again, we have to redeem the narrative. This nation is blessed by immigrants historically. I believe immigrants are a great blessing to America indeed. Hey, listen, they're God-fearing, hardworking, and they have an amazing, amazing commitment to family. God, family, and hard work. Are these anti-American values? Absolutely not. So immigrants may actually enrich right. the collective of the American experience. A really important message, and certainly from your perspective, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining us from California tonight. Th thank you for having me. Support for Amanpour comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, and your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Amanpour. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, and MLSConsumerAccess.org number 3030. Been putting off buying new glasses? Zenni Optical offers a huge variety of high-quality, stylish frames and state-of-the-art optics, starting at just $6.95. We've got all the great frame styles you want, in materials like titanium, carbon fiber, and high-luster acetate. Plus, Zenni offers prescription glasses and sunglasses, so at this great price, you can build your eyewear wardrobe. You can get 10% off your entire order with code 360. So visit Zenni, Z-E-N-N-I, today at zennioptical.com and use code 360. Hey, it's Howard Beck, and I've got Marcus Thompson of The Athletic on Bleacher Reports, the full 48. Kevin Durant was incredible for three straight games. Yes. He was insanely good in all facets of the game. And in the end, he says, I can't do this without Steph. I guarantee you that matters more to Steph than the finals MVP. So check out the full 48 now on the Bleacher Report app or subscribe at Apple Podcasts.
Now, the mental health stress on those children and the families at the border is incalculable. But mental health is an issue that is troubling much of our world, including our youth, in all sorts of different ways. Here in the UK, Prince William has just opened Britain's first ever crisis centre for suicidal men. It's in Liverpool. The recent high-profile suicides of the designer Kate Spade and of our colleague Anthony Bourdain have made us all reflect on the importance of a deeper understanding of the various and complex triggers of deterioration. A big area of concern is social media, not least the pressures of a perfect Instagram world. Now, a new report says that tech addiction should be a public health issue. And Baroness Biban Kidron, whose foundation wrote the report, says children especially urgently need a better deal and she's joining me now welcome to the program thank you good to be here you and we've talked before you've been following this uh, issue of tech addiction and mental health in children very very closely for the last several years i just want to read one of the highlights of your report about the creation of the internet your report basically says the internet is an extraordinary force for good, but it was not designed with children in mind. Despite this, it is now part of every aspect of children's lives, used to socialize, play, create, and learn. It's, you can't get away from it if you're a kid. Absolutely. It's, it's not optional, and I think that's the first thing we have to think about. It wasn't designed for children to be present, and then they're there using these adult services. And it's not just about content, it's about how it's designed. And that's what the report does. It sort of gathers together all the thinking about design and says, is this appropriate for childhood? So we, I mean, we've been doing a lot. We followed a lot of the design of of the internet. We followed a lot along the Facebook and the algorithms and all the apps and things that they do to sort of concentrate uh, their users' minds. What specifically, in regard to children, is, in your view, the design flaw? Well, if you think about things like, you know, default settings, you know, if you have autoplay, you automatically have the next piece, and then you get what you call a tech tantrum. It's, it's not a choice. We're saying we have to redesign it so it's a choice to carry on, not a choice to get off. And everything is like that. The, the, the buzzes and the lights and the brightness. And the thing is that children are in a very, very um, uh, uh, a period of their life where their attention can be grabbed very easily. And what we find is that if you get a kid into a series of habits, it's very hard to get them out. So the World Health Organization just this week has come out and actually uh, said that computer games and video games, I think, are a major mental health issue, right? Absolutely. And the NHS has just uh, said that uh, it, it, game addiction is an issue for them in the, in, in the health service. And you talk about tech addiction and how it should be a public health issue. And uh, let's just take some of these stats from your report. And honestly, they're mind-blowing. Mm. 86% of three to four-year-olds, three to four-year-olds, have access to a tablet. 83% of 12 to 15-year-olds own a smartphone. I mean, yeah. that, that is it. I can't believe the three to four-year-olds. That's almost every three to... Are we talking about just... Great Britain, the United Kingdom? No, we're not. It is a global problem, and our report does look at uh, the UK. But if you think about America, one of the stats that I thought was extraordinary was that 70% of American teenagers are saying they have family conflict over technology use, and, and 30% of those are saying it's every single day. And then we work a lot with children themselves, and they say it's not just them, but they're watching their parents fail to watch them because their parents are on their own devices. So we're creating a world in which nobody's attending to anybody else, and we're all attending to our devices. And for children, I think we have to just remember it has proper impact. So we're seeing social anxiety. We're seeing if you use your, if you use your phone before bed, time you're more likely to have interrupted sleep well that's half of all children we're seeing educational impacts the LSE did a really interesting piece of work where they say actually low achievers achieve even lower 
if they use the phone too much. When they take away the phone, those are the people who benefit most. So it's sort of imprinting more inequality into children's lives. And interestingly, even some of the top private schools in England are, 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 are sort of putting bans on phones, particularly at night, at some of these boarding schools. And they thought they'd have a backlash, but actually the kids have been relieved. Let me just read a couple of the, uh, you know, you've, we're talking about the consequences on children. Um, personal anxiety, social aggression, denuded relationships, sleep deprivation, impact on education, just what you've just been talking about. And children seem to be crying for help. One of them, strolling forever gives me a sick feeling in my stomach. I'm so aware of how little control I have and the feeling of needing to be online and always consuming. So this is like an Instagram always consuming addictive world. What advice do you give to the parents? Well, I think it's really difficult for parents. I mean, we do give advice. We say, you know, detoxify what you can, help your kids switch off, put your own phones down. But I think it's wrong to point at parents yeah. and parent blaming is, is sort of, we can't say that parents and children have to adapt to commercial needs of technology companies. We've got to go again and we say, look, okay, guys. We understand you've done this incredible thing, you've brought us this incredible technology, but you did not anticipate that children would be there. Guess what? A third of all of the three billion users are under 18. That's a third of all users. This is not a marginal problem. And we're saying they are there, so think again. And we're also saying, look at your astronomical share price and don't tell us you'll fall over if you give better deal to the kids. Well, look, it's interesting because um, with uh, Apple, for instance, is a good example. Tim Cook has been saying certain things, but two of Apple's major initial investors have appealed to the company just this year saying there is a developing consensus around the world, including in Silicon Valley, that the potential long term consequences of new technologies need to be factored in at the outset. And no company can outsource that responsibility. So what should companies do? What's the company's role? Because you quote another teenager. It makes me angry that businesses use specific designs to keep young people on their apps or websites. They're exploiting unknowing young people so that they're able to build up ad revenue. This is an ongoing debate. Yeah. Can companies give up ad I know you just talked about the high share price and everything, but but do you think there is a tipping point coming or not? Well, A, I do think there's a tipping point coming. But I think there's a bigger question, which is what other company would we say it was OK to do your business and harm children? Yeah, what, that's not a business model. If you have to harm children to get your revenue, it's not a business model. It's not acceptable. So I think the thing is, actually, there's quite a lot they can do without damaging themselves, you know, and it starts with time out, time off, default off, save buttons, you know, make it frictionless as, to get off as well as on. All of these things. I mean, this, the, the, you know, technology is sometimes treated as if it was mountains and airs, but, it, you know, it's not. It's all designed. In fact, it's rebooted very regularly. And the designs are actually made to entrap kids. And we're saying, New Deal. The other way, let them, them. Let, let them, them free. free. Exactly. Let them free. And so just 30 seconds left. Governments, are governments to legislate this or does it have to be voluntary by the sectors themselves, the, the business? Do you know what? I, I'm really disappointed in voluntary. You know, I think self-regulation has been terrible. They haven't stepped up. We've seen a lot of deals that really haven't been very meaningful. And we are going to regulate and this will be regulated. But I think that on this particular issues, it would be really helpful if governments all over the globe recognized this as a harm and had all the policy and all the education and all the things that flow from that and say this is a public health issue we want our kids with their heads to the sky full of imagination not just here and the kids seem to be taking that initiative themselves at least some of them anyway baroness kidron thank you so much a really important and report and that is it for our program tonight remember you can always listen to our podcast and see us online at amanpour.com and you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching and goodbye from London.